Hi, everyone. This is at Katie Couric. Today we're talking about the disaster in Haiti. Why is it taking so long for aid to reach people who so desperately need it? Also, we're going to take a look at the economic and political factors that made Haiti so vulnerable to this kind of devastation. I'm joined by Ophelia Dahl, the president and executive director of Partners in Health, and Mark Schneider, senior vice president and special advisor on Latin America for the International Crisis Group. As always, a thank you to our sponsor, Dove. Thank you both so much for being here. I, I should mention, Ophelia, Partners in Health is an organization that's been in Haiti for 20 plus years, correct? That's correct. And provides medical care to under, the underserved population, which is virtually the entire population, correct? Well, it's now covering about a third of the country, but it's mostly based out of the city, which was a great advantage to us um, when uh, when this actually this major crisis happened because it struck in the in the capital city and basically cut everything off. Um, but we were in the countryside, so we were able to be one of the first responders. And in fact, I met the doctor who was in charge of uh, Partners in Health in Haiti, and yes. she was amazing, yeah. I should add, Louise Ivers. But let's talk about this aid effort, and then we'll kind of broaden the discussion and talk about Haiti in general. Um, it seemed to me that while supplies were coming in at a pretty uh, sort of consistent pace, ultimately, they were not being distributed out to the people, and the desperation was growing by the hour. Why has it been so hard to distribute not only water and food, but medical supplies, things like plaster casts and other things that needed to treat the kinds of injuries that occurred? I think for the first few days, the, the medical supplies simply were not getting in, and those that were there were brought from other parts of the country, ran out very quickly. I mean, really a drop in the ocean. But now medical supplies are getting in, um, and uh, and they are getting to the places that they're supposed to get. But the, the enormity of this is uh, we, we are sending down supplies as fast as we can, five planes yesterday, another three or four planes, filled with thousands of pounds of medical supplies. But if you run out of something as essential as an anesthesia machine, you can't do surgery. So it's just that they just don't, there's not enough for everyone. But we're talking about when it, it's the injured, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands? I, I would say, uh, you know, this is, this is a guessing game at the moment, but it would be hundreds of thousands of people. And, and I think I've heard the estimate that as many as 20,000 people will die a day who would have been saved by surgery every single day that goes 20, by. 20,000 people every day. These, these are estimates, but approximately. The, uh, the first two days, supplies were not getting through because the airport was also knocked out. But the airport is, there's control of the airport and, uh, and, and the U.S. government is helping very much with that using radar um, off the coast. So planes are getting in, but the other part is logistics on the ground. So you have many, many hundreds of people needing to get a plane load of supplies unloaded, placed on trucks, and then out to the right kinds of places, and then you know to the place that needs it most, which at the moment is the, uh, the general hospital in Port-au-Prince. And, and what are some of the challenges you see, Mark, in terms of, because I was at the airport and I think what Ophelia said was right, it was complete chaos. The Air Force told me everyone thought their relief plane was more important. There was a lot of political, believe it or not, shockingly, I guess it's not so shocking, maneuvering by the Chinese. They told me the Russians claimed they were out of fuel and had to do an emergency landing, even though they weren't and just wanted to offload their supplies. But, but now I think you're right, Tyndall Air Force Base is kind of managing mm -hmm. and giving planes slots so it's a lot less chaotic yeah. at the airport. But it seems to me the real bottleneck was from the airport out to the people. And what are some of the challenges there, Mark? Well, I think some of the challenges include the, the whole issue of security. Uh, the Haitian National Police sort of dissolved as a result of the uh, their police stations collapsing. They were weak in the first place, only 2,000 of them, right? Something no, there like about, that? There were about 8,000 uh, Haitian National Police that have been trained over the course of the last couple of years, um, and, and most of them are in, in uh, Port-au-Prince. And then you had 2,000 UN police as part of the peacekeeping effort. Um, the police for, uh, force in Haiti is pretty weak to begin no with, though, is it? No question about it. Not, yeah. Very weak. And they don't have equipment. Just to give you some idea, the last two graduating classes never learned how to shoot uh, because they didn't have weapons uh, to train uh, or ammunition to train them on. So you have a lot of problems with respect to security. But the other is that I think that they really did expect to be able to move ships in to the port, and the port was unusable as a result of the uh, earthquake. And so the only way of getting things in from the outside is the airport. And then, as you say, the bottleneck from the airport, there's only one main road going out. 
and getting that uh, equipment and relief uh, supplies out of the airport into the areas where people are now obviously congregated is a major problem. And you, I think they're worried also about what happens if you just take one truck, you don't have it secured into an area where you may have a, a lot of people right. desperate, totally desperate. And I think that they're concerned about uh, that situation. Some Air Force folks I spoke to were very frustrated. They said uh, they were upset with USAID. They, uh, they gave me the impression that USAID could not handle this situation. They weren't organized enough. I, I got the sense from sort of everyone on the tarmac, and I don't want to point fingers or play the blame game either, but that nobody was really in charge. In fact, a lot of people seem to say that, that there was no, you know, now who knows, because the country, there was no communication, it was, it was pandemonium, but they wanted to do airdrops right. earlier. They wanted to drop water and food and MREs and, and all that kind of thing. But the Haitian government wouldn't do, wouldn't let them do it because they were worried about riots. But they said they could do it in secure areas that were a little more remote and notify people that supplies were there. There were ways around right. it, they I, said. I have to tell you, though, generally, I know the USAID folks pretty well. This is the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. And, and they really are professional and capable. I'd be very surprised if they weren't, in fact, organized in terms of their own operations. Dropping things from planes is really not a good way to bring aid to anybody. And usually it results in the kind of pandemonium that, that you're talking about that the government was concerned about. But I think also the U.S. Um, and the U.N. were quite concerned as well. Uh, the one thing, though, you have to step back and remember, this is the worst earthquake in the history, not only of the country, but in terms of number of people killed. This is the worst natural disaster in the history of the Western Hemisphere. And so in terms of responding to it, and helping it both immediate and in the longer term, you're going you're to see a, an absolute challenge for every institution, United States, UN, every organization. Is there a better way, though, to do it? Okay, let's say airdrops are, are a little too dangerous right. and, and, and may incite rioting. Um, is there a better way? Because I think you, we were talking before we actually sat down for real to have this conversation, and it, it also seems to me, having been there, every day makes the situation worse, more combustible. And, you know, people were in shock and obviously understandably traumatized early on, but I felt like if they got some of the things they needed, it would kind of tamp down the situation. Now we're talking about almost a week without many of these people having food and right. water right. and all these little babies running around and you can understand how desperate the situation has become. So what, could there have been a better way, I guess? I, I think the answer is, is that there's never going to be enough aid getting to the people who need it fast enough to satisfy anybody. And what they're talking about now is 14 areas that have presumably been secured where they can bring aid in the, today as well. And have the Water, 82nd Airborne there right, protecting exactly. it? That's right, exactly. The 82nd Airborne and uh, peacekeeping forces from the United Nations. Um, and they're going to, I think the idea would be to get food, water, et cetera, to, and shelter uh, to those areas and then branch out and begin to develop beyond the 14 substantially larger numbers of secure areas that they can respond to. What are you hearing from your people in terms of the slow pace of this? Yeah, well, I think to go back to security for one moment, and um, we're, we're, on, we're speaking to our folks on the telephone daily um, through satellite phones, but also getting emails and texts from them. Um, there's no doubt that there are pockets of insecurity and, and, uh, and, and areas that would be of concern around very limited resources and supplies. But the overwhelming message we're getting from our folks on the ground, both, both people who are not experienced with Haiti, but, but also those who are, is of the really extraordinary peacefulness and calm um, two of my colleagues said that the, the first uh, two nights, they, the only noise um, coming from areas where there are 50,000 people lying in varying degrees of, of terrible distress mm. um, with, with cradling loved ones and everything else, is that of singing, of taking care of one another, of washing each other, of, um, of great uh, comforting of a community, 
not even taking care of only family members, but really taking care of one another. Are you starting to hear through Louise Ivers and mm -hmm. other medical mm -hmm. professionals on the ground that you're starting to get the things they need to take care of people, you yes. know? Yes, and I think it depends. I think that there are, you know, a number of different groups that are working there and are working a crazy amount of time and, and um, relief groups that have made their way in very early through the DR or through other, or through other routes um, and a lot of people working very hard. Um, the shortage has been the logistics around supplies. I think that there was a lot of desire to get planes in and, and as you've already said that there was a chaos there to begin with but the, the need is enormous and, and getting supplies so that to give you an idea of the general hospital, um, there's, uh, we're, we're, we've been asked to coordinate logistics and medical care at the general hospital. This um, isn't the university hospital. This is the oh, it is because I went there actually. Yeah, which is now 1,500 as of last night, so probably more like 2,000 patients are, are, are there. 80 percent of them in dire need of surgical care, so will need, you know, or, or, or will die very, very soon. Um, and uh, they're lined up. They have five working ORs at the moment. They want to do 10 and they want to do round the clock care. So they're doing it in makeshift tents and, um, and then, one, you know, we, we were get, went getting urgent messages all day yesterday. We've run out of ketamine, so we would What's raise that? them. It's a, it's a drug that's used in anesthesia and it's basically, sometimes it's used for people who, who um, you can't, I believe, I'm not, a, I'm not an MD, but you can't necessarily anesthetize completely. It's a, it's a very powerful drug mm -hmm. that, that sort of puts you out and takes away uh, any memory of the, 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 the pain. So it's a powerful um, mm -hmm. uh, part of anesthesia. Because they have to do a lot of amputations. They're doing mm -hmm. amputations. I mean, one colleague who is a very seasoned doctor in Haiti um, said to me that the sound, the smell of death and the sound of amputations is mm -hmm. something that's not going to leave his head for a long time. But uh, they'd like to get 10 hours going there and then um, having round the clock. So, you know, you need fuel and you need cash and you need um, food and water for, for the, the people who are providing the care and then the patients as well. And you also have a major problem in terms of the fuel, not only for yes. the the medical facilities, but simply to to move vehicles around. Yeah, yeah. you know, there were gas state lines at gas stations and I guess, you know, if they don't have the electricity that right. push make the, makes the generators go, they can't pump the gas, right? right. So are they bringing they fuel from, in? From the, well, they're, they're bringing fuel from the Dominican Republic. Um, yes. The United Nations is bringing in, the U.S. is bringing in as well. My understanding was that they, were, they had a shipment on the way. USAID puts out a, a, a daily, twice a day sort of uh, report. They and the U.N., um, the Office of Coordination for Humanitarian Relief, and they, I forget the numbers, but a substantial amount of fuel they're trying to bring in uh, right now. Mm. And I think the idea is to at least ensure that you're getting some of those generators that continue to operate in, in the medical mm. facilities. It's not just the general hospital, but there's several other hospitals mm. that are right. functioning. And they've, they've got to get those and there are all these, them. you know, I met the, the BFAS team from Belgium, right. mm -hmm. and they were amazing. Yeah. They got there in 24 hours. They were set up in the lab, right in front of the lab next to the University Hospital. Right. And, you know, I had this harrowing experience, not, I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. it's, you can't compare it to what everyone's going through, where this little boy was screaming, and the doctor looked at me, Ophelia, and he said, can you get us some plaster casts? Yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm in the middle of Haiti. Yeah. I would love to get you plaster yeah. casts. Where do I get plaster yeah. casts, exactly. I said. Yeah. And he yeah. said, I don't know, just get them. Yeah. And it was actually, I felt so helpless. Yeah. Yeah. And it was very frustrating for him, clearly. Yeah. Because I guess fractures, I'm not a doctor, obviously, but you need to take care of broken limbs yes. pretty quickly, right? What and happens if you don't? Well, it, 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 blood loss, first of all. I mean, there's a lot of uh, open wounds and, and terrible, complicated fractures. Um, and then at secondary, you know, wound infections that will kill people very quickly, particularly those that are already vulnerable and have had no... You mean you know, open wounds? Or what about if you just have a broken well, leg? Well, broken like leg is bad enough, but most of the wounds that we're, we're hearing reports of are open wounds. Gashes. Uh, open wounds with, no, open fractures, meaning mm. the fracture is the so complicated. Fracture. Yeah, and head injuries. Yeah. Yeah. head injuries. I can't tell you how many yeah. people, I saw this 17-year-old yeah. girl in a tent set up with Doctors Without Borders. I mean, bless her heart, she was completely swollen. Her head, I think, had partially been shaved off. She was sitting there, and it was Friday morning, right. mm -hmm. and there was no doctors in these tents set up yeah. by Doctors Without Borders. Yeah. And I'm, again, I'm not being critical. It was just so maddening to me. And this poor woman was just sitting there waiting, and her, yeah. her cousin had been said she couldn't walk. She'd been paralyzed. Yeah. If you think about 
the death toll being perhaps reaching 100,000, then you have to assume that the number of injured mm. is a multiple of that. And, and there's just no capacity in, in Haiti, even if there hadn't been anything destroyed. There was no, no capacity in Haiti to Can deal with that. Can we talk about that? Because, you know, of course, you think this is obviously compounding a very, very difficult mm. society to begin with that has so little, no fire department, no military, the police terribly ill-equipped to handle really right. any kind of mm. emergency. There's no systemic infrastructure, not to mention physical infrastructure, in that country. How did Haiti get to be such a mess? I know that is like a ridiculously broad question, but I know there are many factors. Can yeah. you put it into perspective I mean, for I us? Mean, if you think about, this is a country that was created as a result of slaves revolting against uh, the control of uh, colonial powers. The they, French. The French. And they never, they never really were able to move in, away from um, the, uh, to have a, a functioning state in an effective way. Remember, the United States occupied Haiti for a significant number of years. Like, that was sort 1915, of... 1915, 1933. Right. I mean, 18 years. Then, uh, and then after that, you had, uh, you had the Papa Doc Duvalier um, dictatorship, followed by the Sun. And so you really didn't have the beginnings of a, any kind of a uh, representative uh, government until the late 1980s. And since then, you're starting to put, to, trying to put together not only ministries, but you're trying to put together a nationwide system of governance that might be effective. And it's obviously a very difficult process. Let me just give you one. The, the thing that always struck me when I've been going to Haiti for a long time is that still today, at least 40% of the school children, this is before the earthquake and before the hurricanes 18 months ago, 40% of the school children are not in school. Of those who are, 80% are in private schools with almost no regulation. So you don't have a public education system. I know, it's so shocking. I mean, I guess it's not shocking because what kind of tax base do they have to support it? Well, that's part of it. But also the, the fact is that there's a very narrow economic elite that uh, has not wanted to expand that tax base. And th as a result, you have a lot of tax evasion even where the tax rate is very, very low. So the ability of the state to provide services, education, health, is virtually nil. Yeah. And that's what has to be, the, the idea w that people were moving to was you need to change that. And last year you had a poverty reduction strategy. Everybody agreed to it. Things were moving. And then Haiti gets hit with this kind of natural disaster. There's going to have to be, and I think people need to recognize this, there's going to have to be the largest ever support program, development program, assistance program, private sector support, governments for a single country in the Western Hemisphere ever. And if this upper class needs to and change. The upper class Because I kept reading a, a time and time again that there was sort of no culture mm. of helping the underclass in Haiti. And in fact, it was the, it was the do desired thing to oppress the underclass mm. of Haiti and to not lift them out of poverty in any way. Well, unfortunately, there, that's been too common. And, and the reverse is that the Haitians themselves, that the vast majority of communities outside of Port-au-Prince, but also in, in Cité Solo, the, the community has an enormous amount of strength mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And they were, as you heard in the immediate aftermath of the quake, they work to help each other. And what you need now is you need a, a social compact that engages the rest of Haiti, mm. the private sector, the elite as well, in participating in an effort to rebuild the country. The U.S. has tried, hasn't it, Mark? I mean, they've been involved in Haiti for a long time, but it seems to me with very mixed results. Is that a fair assessment? A fair, I mean, I've been heavily involved in that, and there's no question that, that we have not achieved what anyone wanted. And part of it is, is you have a few years of massive engagement, and then attention drifts, other things mm -hmm. intervene, and the U.S. steps back. And that's what's happened over the course of the mm -hmm. past eight years, really. And, and I think that what you saw was, as a result, you wound up with the, as you know, President Aristide forced to leave in 2004. Yeah, well, tell me again why Aristide was forced to leave, because I'm confused about that. Well, there, was a, there, were, there were a lot of um, reports that, and there was significant opposition. There were groups that moved into the country 
that uh, where there was a possibility of a lot of violence, and he was convinced to leave. And that's when you had a transition from 2004. Convinced by whom? Convinced by the international community, the United States, part of that, France, et cetera. Um, but and why? Because they felt that, the, they, at least they argued, whether they believed it or not, they argued that uh, if he stayed, there was going to be widespread violence and bloodshed. And there was a... But because there was just an uprising? Or there was an uprising, and there were, there were people, uh, organized groups with, with arms coming from uh, outside the country as so well. So it was to stave yeah. off a coup? That's the, that was the argument. And, and as a result, he left, and you then had a two-year transition until the election of President Preval in 2006. I think there were many factors also, um, and I'm sure Mark will agree, that, w that helped to destabilize the um, democratically elected President Aristide, including the fact that aid was, was, was very, very, it was basically restricted. a trickle and restricted. So for... Why? Um, well, if you look at w the aid that flowed during the, the dictatorships, true dictatorships of the Duvaliers and... Uh, for, for decades. It was a, a, an almost a free-flowing aid, and I first went to Haiti in 1983 when Baby Doc was in power, and uh, uh, there was enormous amounts of U.S. aid um, and aid from other countries that was flowing there. When it, it entered a period of, of um, fragility around trying to elect its own leader, so if you imagine that 10% uh, at the very most, I should say, of the, of the country is um, a, uh, a, a literate and, and moneyed elite. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the country are either, um, you know, the urban poor or the landless poor, most of them in rural Haiti. So for the first time uh, when Aristide came to power um, or came to be recognized and was elected overwhelmingly by a majority of people who, who walked for hours, if not days, to be mm -hmm. able to elect him. So the destabilizing of, of uh, you know, this, this president, although very controversial, and I recognize that, um, was, uh, was, I think, helped by, by forces larger, um, certainly the, the elite force within Haiti that, that wields most of the power. So they didn't like him because he was popular with the masses? Well, they, they also they felt that he was uh, anti-business, the leftist, etc. Remember, he was overthrown the first time that he was elected um, by the military and uh, and finally, the, o the OAS and the UN and the US and others um, attempted to bring him back. They did. Uh, President Clinton came in and, and uh, he was returned. And uh, a year and a half later, you had the election of President Preval the first time. And then when President Aristide, when Aristide was reelected in 2000, it was, then there was a change in administration here. And you had a polarization in terms of support for Haiti. And, and uh, as we've heard, uh, aid was restricted. What about, which seems crazy to me, that the aid was restricted at a time when they had a chance to? Well, I can, I can only surmise that it's in order to destabilize. I mean, I, I, I'm in Haiti frequently, too, and I can remember times um, where the, the destabilize, it takes very little to destabilize, cut off aid, and then you have uh, important life-saving supplies for people like kerosene so that they can have a lamp in their heart mm. at night now if you if you if you stop subsidies um, and y you you suddenly have a, a family that can't even afford this much uh, kerosene and they say this darn government you know you you can do all kinds of things that will undermine um, somebody's ability to to govern a country well I mean the, you, know, you have to again go back to the level of poverty in the country, mm -hmm. the lack of resources, lack of institutions. You mentioned earlier, you know, eighty percent of the population lives on less than two dollars a day, fifty percent on less than a dollar a day. Um, the 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 statistics in in Haiti are daunting. The just maternal mortality, the, uh, it's seventy times worse than the United States. One out of every Eight children die before they reach the age of five. I mean, they're just the life expectancy too, isn't it? Just fifty-three or something like exactly. that. Exactly, and and th there has never been an extension of services outside the capital city in a way to provide basic education and health and opportunity. Mm. And I think there's no Haitian dream. You know, I feel like you're there's born no in Haitian poverty dream. and you die in poverty for the most part. Is there a chance to, to get there, your way I, out? You were talking about I, lack of education. I actually think there was a beginning that was yes. taking place of hope. Yes. And, you know, the uh, Preval's uh, used this, this term for his movement, L'Espoir. And I think the fact is mm. that over the last couple of years, you'd seen some movement forward. 
not only the beginning of some private investment, um, but some reforms on the police that seem to be creating mm -hmm. a non-corrupt police force for the first time. Last year, 60% of the population said they approved of the Haitian National Police. And this is the first time that I can remember ever mm -hmm. anybody talking about Haitian police in a positive way. Even, even uh, you know, making sure that there is the kind of um, support so that you have to have, um, I, one of the things that Paul Farmer has been doing recently is working as uh, the UN Deputy right. Special Envoy, precisely for this reason. I mean, uh, 25 years in, in Haiti as we've, as Partners in Health has been there, you, you create some deep roots and, one of the, and, and you learn a lot, hopefully you learn a lot. And we've learned over the years that actually trying to strengthen the public set, sector rather than creating just separate charity hospitals has been very key. Um, so finding ways to support a government and the ministries, especially in rebuilding uh, this country now, is going to be absolutely essential. And rebuilding in a way that is safe. You know, the mayor of Port-au-Prince, I guess the school collapsed, right? Not yes. the, uh, what, a year, a year ago? ago and he said 60% yeah, of the no. buildings in Port-au-Prince are yeah. substandard, shabby, yeah. and could not withstand. Yeah. I mean, I guess they don't have zoning laws no, or building codes, they right? They don't have building codes, and they just started to prepare new mm. ones, but they don't have a mechanism for enforcing them. Mm. Uh, when I went there about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, I remember going to this, with the Minister of Education to one of the few public schools in Port-au-Prince, and on the second floor, he wanted me to see the classroom, and I went to the classroom, and then I looked down. I could look through the floor to the first mm. floor. It was just little slats of wood with no support. Can Haiti do this on its own? No. Can, I mean, not, I, don't, I don't mean just monetarily. No. I mean administratively. I mean organizationally. You, you're going to have to have triage. You're going to have to have sort of a, an international partnership in every ministry, in every sector of government. And it can't be just Port-au-Prince. It has to go out to the communities, out to the, the rural areas, local uh, municipalities. Do you think there will be a long-term commitment, though? It has yeah. such a history of, of neglect and even, even sort of getting isolated right. by its neighbors. Let's be clear. Uh, Haiti didn't become impoverished on its own. It's not going to, mm. you know, re rebuild on its own. And I think that, that making sure that there are strong, strong partners in this, in this effort is going to be vital. Um, just to give you an I idea, there are many different wonderful charities working in Haiti trying to support people. The, the interest in compassion and outpouring is, is, is I mean, it's, it's the heartening thing that's come out of this. But when you have 10,000 separate charities working together trying to do things and not necessarily coordinating through ministries of health or ministries of education, I, I, I think that's been part of the problem and must We're be part of the solution. We're talking here about the private Charities are likely to provide maybe five or ten million dollars in assistance, and it's fantastic. What Haiti is going to need is going to need a national, sort of a national rebuilding effort with the international community that reaches into the billions of dollars. I remember in, in Central America after Hurricane Mitch, we had commitments of six billion dollars about six weeks after the hurricane hit. Mm. You're talking about the need for several times that. Yeah. If you're going to see, do you Haiti. think the international community is going to want to do that? You know, many people in this country are going to say, "Hey, we have our own right. problems. Right. We're engaged in two wars. Our deficit is right. out of control." I think they're going to want to do it, and and you know, the the, the private charities. I mean, Partners in Health alone has a twenty-five million dollar commitment every right. year. So, there are ten thousand charities. I think there's more money coming into Haiti, um, but enough. Uh, uh, no, not no. enough, not no. enough. But I, but I do think that they, I think the international, I have great faith in the international community. I think it's going to see this as a, as a, as a chance to mm. rebuild. I hope President, so. President Obama said something yesterday when he, he issued an executive order that essentially called up some of the reserves mm -hmm. to work in Haiti, military reserves and right. Coast Guard. And he said that this is going to be a long-term commitment and we're not going to abandon Haiti. And my assumption is, is that President Obama, other heads of state, along with Secretary General, are going to have to come together in the next, and I'm talking a couple of weeks, to set in motion mm -hmm. a plan for reaching some kind of agreement on a single strategy. The point that you made is crucial. You have to have a coordinated effort, and there has to be a single strategy. Who's in I, charge of that effort? I mean, it's got to be the United Nations with support from the United States, the World Bank, and others, but there has to be a single coordination point for this effort.
Let me ask you about some Twitter questions. I'm, I'm going over my allotted time, but I think this is so important. You know, um, I think we were talking about international aid, and, and I know a lot of people want to help. Mm. But I think some people are concerned because of the history of corruption. I'm trying to find this mm. specific question. Um, well, I, I'm just going to actually rephrase this Twitter question because I know we had one. Um, they're they're afraid that the money's not going to get to the to the place it's it needs because they hear so much about government corruption. Yeah. So, what are some of the best ways to help immediately or even help mm -hmm. for the long term? Two things. One immediately is if you you want to strengthen the education system. What Brazil did, what Mexico has done, conditional cash transfers. You get the money directly to the family. And you say, you get the money every month, you just have to keep your kids in school. Mm -hmm. That's one way. The other, so how do you find these families? How, how do you kind of team up with these families? The, the, the way that you do this is you essentially have in every community, sort of block by block and, and neighborhood by neighborhood, you have a mechanism for ensuring that they know that if they go to this bank or they go to this but what Local. I'm saying is, yeah. if somebody's listening to this, Mark, they're like, okay, well, how do I do that? Who do I call? Who do I make the arrangements well, with? Hopefully, the international community is going to make the arrangements to get the money into the system in Haiti, and then they'll set up a system like exists now in Brazil, where you go into a, a central place, like going to the post office. And each month you get it, you just have to show that your child's in school. And I'd add that, you know, corruption and um, a bit like the security can be a door closing argument rather than a door opening mm -hmm. argument. We mustn't let the idea of a, a fragile security in Port-au-Prince be a reason not to provide aid. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the corruption is, is everywhere. I have, you know, I've worked in Haiti for a long time. We have 4,000 employees and $25 million going in there. 2.6 million patient visits every year. Um, corruption does not seem to be the, um, the overriding factor here. Pockets of violence, pockets of corruption, same as in the United States, what? same as in any state. One so, other way to do oh, it sorry, is you have a single, if you have a single fund that's managed, let's say, by the UN and then and partnered with the Haitian ministry, mm -hmm. you could see that whenever you sign a contract, you have to have two signatures on it. Uh, we did this in Liberia with the World Bank. We've done it, it actually did it after Hurricane Mitch in Honduras, mm. which is a country known for corruption. Mm. But in fact, that aid got to the people. And it got to the people in terms of rebuilding infrastructure. Remember, in Haiti, you're going to have to rebuild an enormous amount of infrastructure, in some cases, for the first time. What about immediate help? Is it the International Red Cross, Partners in Health, um, you uh, know, any other organizations that you feel are really you know, the, Critical. The, there's no question that, that there are a lot of good, good relief right. groups out there. There's no question. But having, um, and, and they should be supportive, if supported and, and, uh, and are, and it's going to need, you know, the, the need so outstrips the, the response, although the response has been fantastic. So there are a lot of organizations. But having, having deep roots in a country and having 4,000 employees is a very good way to be able to, to help to coordination and not being based in the capital city. Mm -hmm. Partners in Health is a guiding principle of um, something we call accompaniment. Um, we do it with patients. It's the way we've been able to treat patients and we've done it with um, most of the trained doctors and nurses that have come from the general hospital. I think that we need to take that principle of accompaniment even further. Um, we, we as an organization are being accompanied by the generous people who are giving us money. I think we have to, comp uh, this country has to accompany Haiti and we have to find ways to do, to do this in, uh, that, that's gonna make sense for the, for the long, the long distance. I think that the principle that the organizations that have been in Haiti, that know Haiti, mm. and that have a national network yes. are the ones that should be the, the top of the list. I mean, they include Partners in Health, they include Mercy Corps, they include CARE, they include other yeah. organizations, Pan American Development yeah. Foundation, which by the way is the organization of American states designated mm. uh, entity to move money into communities where it's needed. That's true. And, and the other thing, to be clear, is that Partners in Health is essentially a healthcare organization. Mm -hmm. We're going to need um, engineers without borders, right. and we're going to need, we, we're, we're all pa already partnering with Mercy Corps. There needs to be great partnerships with groups that have different areas of expertise, and, and in right. the months and years to come, that's going to be lawyers and engineers and builders and, and, uh, and infrastructure experts. And, and I think it's important that I've talked to the, now the Prime Minister when he was Minister of Planning. And he was very concerned 
that the work of these groups, which is crucial, be coordinated with the work of the government mm. and be operating on, on, a, on a unified plan. Yeah. But even though the major coherence. ministries have been destroyed, I mean, well, that's what you're going to have to rebuild. Ken yeah. Preval, I mean, is I, I, I again. Does he have what it takes to oversee an effort of this magnitude? Not if by himself. He's supported. But he needs to have support. Yeah. The other thing is I think that you're going to have to see the kind of accompaniment take place at the governmental level so that the U.S., Canada, others bring in experts to sit with the top yeah. officials of each, of each new ministry being created and to work with them. We don't want to bring into Haiti again, let's say, typewriters or we want them to bring in computer systems. We want to train them how to use them. We don't want them to use this, the, the logistic systems that they had that are from the 1930s. Because one of the things, uh, we had a wonderful driver named Sebastian whose house was destroyed and his wife and a right. child two and one and a half mm -hmm. in a refugee camp. And he said, they don't train us to do anything here. Mm -hmm. You know, if I wanted to be in broadcasting, there's no place I can go. If I wanted to do be a pharmacist, there's no place right. I can go. I can't go to school unless I have money, basically, is That's what he right. said to right. me. Right. So Those I mean, private schools cost right. money. So support the Ministry of Health right. to, to start with education, primary education, secondary, and then, mm -hmm. um, and then higher education. There's no lack of thirst for educations. We found with, with, with all of our patients, the first thing that happens when they get well, when we say to them, what do you, what do you need mm -hmm. after they've had their basic needs taken care of? Can I learn to read? Can I go to school? Mm -hmm. And then, can I get a job? Mm -hmm. It's so heartbreaking, you know, how little these people have and how much they could do if they just had the basics, you yes. know? Yes, yes. No question about that. So, maybe I hope the world's attention stays focused on Haiti. That's the big question, isn't that's, it? That's the most important thing that you can continue to do is to make sure that it does stay focused on Haiti. Yeah. Well, crisis intervention is, uh, it's an extraordinary thing at this time while the crisis is going on, but there's been a chronic crisis going on in Haiti and that chronic crisis will be magnified uh, a thousand fold if we don't find ways to support. If everything goes country. well, yeah. how long do you think it would take to make Haiti a better place. You know, somebody used the term, how long would it take to make Haiti, Haiti the level of Central America, not level of, of Canada, or et cetera? And, and the answer is probably a couple of decades. But at the very least, in a decade, you could see major change. And that's what we have to aim at is a decade. Well, I really enjoyed talking to you because, of course, I went down there and I was so curious and you're mm -hmm. so struck by you know, you hear about the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere and the abject poverty, mm. but then you see it and you think, how do these people have a chance, yeah. you know, mm. even without an earthquake? Well, and remember, we're going in now for this summer, you're going to start again with the hurricane season. Yeah. You know, Haiti, it, it, it's <clears throat> remarkable. Haiti, a hundred years ago, had 80% of its land covered with forests. Even in 1940, about 20%, and now 2%. Yeah. And so when anything happens, yeah. there's nothing to withstand. The watersheds just sort of So just mudslides happen and just mud flooding. Exactly. That, that, that school in Port-au-Prince you're talking about fell down because of heavy rains. Right. The, the uh, you know, President Clinton used the, f the, the phrase after the hurricanes about building back better. Mm -hmm. So taking care of the, the, um, the, the resources and the, and the deforestation and all of those kinds of things at this point will be important to making making right. uh, this move. And one of the keys is Haiti uses charcoal yeah. for all of its its cooking fuel. Right. But it also uses charcoal for dry cleaners, for laundries, mm. for bakeries. Every small business, they use charcoal as their fuel. Mm. That has to be changed. Yeah. There just has to be some way of getting out of that sort of cycle of destruction of the, the, the trees in the country. That will help food security as well. That, uh, another chronic problem in, yeah. in Haiti. I mean, how, how so? Well, if you've got, you, you've got a population that are desperately trying to find fuel to be able to mm -hmm. you know, cook one if they're lucky. I mean, most people, th this is a country that is making, where, where people in the countryside are making mud cookies. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, making, they're making food out of dirt. Um, so, uh, you know, making sure that there are, there are trees and that there's investment in agricultural efforts will be very, very important. Fuel and food security. Right. And the other is that it, as this plan for reconstruction takes place, one of the most important things it can do is make sure that the investments are not just in Port-au-Prince, but that they're around the country, mm -hmm. that creating regional poles of development, 
that permit then those localities to have a market near their farms mm. and that, that then act as a break on people drifting into Port-au-Prince because that's where all of the resources and jobs are. What you need to do now is try and change that. This is an opportunity, in a sense, to do that. So overwhelming but doable, ultimately. Hope, I don't think we have any other choice except to try. I say it's doable. All right, Ophelia Dahl and Mark Schneider, both of you, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. your time. Hopefully some people will watch and become more interested in helping Haiti and understand the country better. That was our goal. And to find out how you can help the people of Haiti, you can go to cbsnews.com and click on how you can help. Thank you so much for watching and stay with CBS News for continuing coverage of this disaster. And now stay tuned for a, a message from our sponsor, Dove.